Thank you. Um, so, as Barrett said, there's been a lot of hype about this new AI technology called deep learning. What I hope to do in the next 20 minutes is share with you um, what is happening in deep learning and what isn't, so that after these 20 minutes, you'll be able to walk away and think strategically as you lead your organizations um, how to use deep learning, when to use it, when not to use it, as well as understand some of the trends in terms of how deep learning will, I think, affect the mobile world. So for at least 15 years now, many of us have had this picture of the virtuous circle of AI in which we thought that by building a great product, we can acquire a lot of users. Having a lot of users allows us to get a lot of data, be it clickstream data, survey data, behavioral data, and then having a lot of data allows us to use AI to keep on improving our products. But this picture hasn't worked out yet for the most part. And what was missing was the AI link of this didn't quite work. More specifically, for the older generations of AI algorithms and learning algorithms, even as we gave them more data, uh, their performance didn't keep on improving. It was as if the older generations of algorithms didn't know what, what to do with all the data that we're now able to give them. And cutting through all the hype of AI and neural networks and deep learning, the one fundamental reason why deep learning is taking large tech companies by storm is that insofar as any of us have been able to measure, with these new AI algorithms, deep learning algorithms, as far as any of us have been able to measure, the more data you feed it, the better the, their performance. And so for leading tech companies with a lot of data in a regime of, deep, uh, of big data, deep learning is leading uh, performance for a lot of applications. And so it feels to me that for the first time, this is allowing us to really close that link in the virtuous circle of AI and now start going around this circle to build better and better products. So um, for those of you that have heard of deep learning, uh, deep learning algorithms are inspired loosely by neurons in the brain. And so your brain and mine is, works, is jam packed full of neurons and all human thought works by having neurons in our heads pass electrical impulses to each other. Deep learning algorithms, also called neural networks, are based on a very loose simulation of the brain. Um, one of the reasons that there's been so much hype about deep learning is that that soundbite that I just used, deep learning algorithms simulate the brain, that soundbite is so easy for scientists and for reporters to use uh, that it has led to, unfortunately, excessive hype about AI and machines taking over the world. Uh, the reality is that, honestly, we have almost no idea how the brain works. We really have pretty much no idea, and deep learning algorithms are very loosely inspired by the brain at the 50,000 foot level. But you know, when you look at the details, they're really unlike what the brain really does. Um, having said that, they are doing amazing things for technology today. I'll give some examples. One of the questions that interested me several years ago uh, was what really drives the performance of these neural networks when you want to use them for advertising, speech recognition, all the things. Insofar as we've been able to measure, the biggest determiner, the biggest driver of how well your neural networks can perform is just how big can you build them. Um, and so some of you will know that over the past several years, I spent quite a bit of my career working to build bigger and bigger neural networks. Uh, three, four years ago, the biggest neural networks had about 10 million connections. So we have neurons, and these are still about 10 million wires between our simulated neurons. So it was about three and a half years ago, I started a project uh, called the Google Brain Project, which used um, Google's cloud to scale this up uh, significantly using a lot of servers. Shortly after, we realized, actually I realized that this was actually the wrong technology and that rather than using cloud-based technology, we should use HPC style technology, which is very different. And so my small team at Stanford was able to build similar sized networks using vastly smaller numbers of servers by using GPU, HPC technology, different types of hardware. Um, and we're able to build even larger networks using relatively modest numbers of computer servers. And more recently at uh, Baidu, um, by using, uh, uh, which, which I think Baidu was the first company to build a GPU cluster to do large scale neural networks, to do deep learning, we're able to push this even further. And I think that, um, uh, and so this is driving the performance of a lot of applications in large tech companies. Uh, one of the applications that I helped build, which, which I'm most proud of, is um, vastly improved speech recognition. 
So today, leading tech companies uh, uh, such as Google, Baidu, and others have tens of thousands of hours of speech data. And it turns out that um, deep learning algorithms, neural networks, are very good at soaking up these tens of thousands of hours of speech data and learning to transcribe speech. Um, and so if any of you use uh, speech recognition on the Android ecosystem, uh, you're actually using software that you know, my team helped write. Um, and more broadly, companies like Baidu and uh, Google and Facebook and Amazon and, Net and, and Microsoft and uh, Netflix and others have a lot of data for a lot of different verticals. Um, and so for Baidu, speech recognition and image search as well as advertising and, and many other products are powered by deep learning. And the reason we do these things using deep learning is because we have tons of data for all of these applications. Uh, we have a lot of data with a lot of images. We know what images users are clicking on when they come do an image search on Baidu and we have a lot of advertising data. And so this is having a material economic impact on companies like Baidu and many others that have a lot of data. Since this is GMIC, um, what I thought I'd do is speak a bit about the way that I think deep learning is, uh, has the potential to transform mobile and the internet of things. Until recently, really maybe even today, most internet communications has been text-based, right? Web pages were about text. Um, what I see, what we see happening is a shift from internet, of internet communications from text towards speech and images. Not a complete shift, but a partial shift. And so um, deep learning is a fantastic technology for having computers understand text. But what I'd like to do is spend a little bit more time sharing with you some of the trends that I see pertaining to deep learning and uh, uh, to speech and images. So um, today, 10% of search queries to Baidu come through voice search or come through speech recognition. Um, I guess, as you know, Baidu operates primarily in China. Many of the users in China are less, many of our users are relatively less sophisticated. Uh, many of our users are either illiterate or unable to write, uh, uh, type pinyin, type Chinese characters. And if you're unable to type on a cell phone for whatever reason, uh, we have to let you speak to us in order to help find, understand, and provide to you your information needs. Um, I think many of you are from China, some of you are from the US. The China mobile ecosystem, as many of you know, is extremely different than the US mobile ecosystem. Um, we have a lot of users that are relatively unsophisticated. And, uh, uh, and actually, I'll give you an example. You know, we, um, in China, we actually get queries that you would never imagine getting in the United States. So sometimes we get users that come to us and, and they'll say things to us like, um, hi Baidu, how are you? Um, I ate noodles at the corner store last weekend, and it was delicious. Do you think the noodles are on sale this weekend? You know, like, that's the query. But to serve that category of users, we actually invest in speech recognition and natural language processing to try to, uh, to, try to, to, try to understand and respond to their information needs. But more broadly, I think that speech recognition is one of the technologies where we've made tons of progress in the last couple of years, but I think the best is yet to come. And I think that speech is one of the technologies that will, that will revolutionize mobile. As the whole world moves to mobile, um, I think no one has yet figured out a good user interface for these cell phones, which is why we spend so much time typing on these tiny little keyboards. Speech recognition. We've seen about a 30% reduction in word error rate. It works much better now than it did a year or two ago. But if you're driving in a noisy car, and if your cell phone is on the passenger seat next to you, you won't even try to command your cell phone by mobile because it's too noisy. If only we can get speech recognition to work better, I think we can cause all of us in this room to undergo a discrete switch in the way we interact with our mobile devices. I would love to be able to send a text message to my spouse, to my wife, even when, even when I'm driving in a noisy car. We just don't do that today. Um, more broadly, I think that speech recognition will also revolutionize the internet of things. Um, several months ago, when was this back? It was uh, back in October, no, no uh, uh, was it uh, September? Um, we announced a project called the uh, Baidu Coolbox, which is a music player um, uh, plus alarm clock that is speech activated. Um, more recently, Amazon also announced a similar project. But the vision, this is not a product, this is a research exploration. But the vision is that um, uh, 
today, if you're sitting at home and you want to listen to music, it, you know, it will take you about a minute to pull out your cell phone and unlock it and navigate to your music app. But if you have an application like this, sitting at home, uh, I would love for you to, to just be able to speak across your house and say, you know, Baidu Cool Box, please play some you know, Justin Timberlake for me and have it stream the appropriately licensed music. Um, but more broadly, I think that speech recognition, which has improved a lot already and will continue to improve, I believe, in the next few years, I think is just a much better user interface for a lot of mobile and Internet of Things devices. Um, I think that a few years from now, we will look back at uh, TV remote controls that we have in our houses and say, you know, wow, that was a really silly idea. We just talk to a TV. Um, several years from now, so actually some of you know I've been, I've been married for, what, seven months now? So no children nor grandchildren yet. But I actually hope that many years from now, my grandchildren will come to me and say, oh, grandpa, is it really true that when you were young, if you went home and um, spoke to your microwave oven, is it really true that your microwave oven would just sit there and ignore you? I mean, that, that, that just seems so rude. Uh, and, and so I think speech will have a huge impact on all of these things. Um, so talked a lot about speech. The other technology that where, where I see, where I predict huge product and mobile implications is uh, images. Computer vision is hard, right? Uh, if we look at these pictures, I mean, how on earth can it, can a computer understand what's happening in these pictures? If I asked you to describe these pictures, for the picture on the left, you might write a caption like that. Yellow bus driving our road with green trees that are in the background. If I asked you to describe the picture on the right, uh, you might write a caption like that. You know, living room, right? Blue uh, couch, carpeting, the room in the apartment, get some afternoon sun. These are the sorts of captions you, might, you or I might write to describe these images. And, our, and, and your ability to write captions like these shows that you kind of understand what's happening in these images. Can a computer possibly understand images at this level? Well, I have a surprise for you. These captions were not written by humans. They were written by a deep learning algorithm. Um, so uh, uh, this, this is one of those technologies that I think is incredible. Uh, Baidu was actually the first to announce this sort of technology. Other companies are now following suit. But I think that um, computers are starting to understand images. And I don't think we know yet what the right what the killer app, or exactly what the right product is for a lot of these images technology. But I think the technological foundation gives us a, a fantastic base to build on and to explore these things. To, to show you some of the things we're thinking about, you know, if you're out walking in a field of flowers and you want to recognize what this is, I mean, it's very difficult to express what you see as a text query. How do you describe this to a web search engine to have it tell you the name of the flower? So one of the relatively unique features of, of our search engine is that we encourage users to take a picture and upload the picture. So the picture is the query. Using a deep learning algorithm, we can recognize that this is a hyacinth and then send you to either an encyclopedia or to a flower shop, depending on what we think is your information need. Um, more broadly, it turns out about 35% of the query by image um, pictures we get appear, we can't really tell, they appear to be things that users could buy or might want to buy. And so today, if you see someone wearing a piece of clothing or you see a handbag that you like, if you take a picture, we use deep learning to try to recognize the handbag or the clothing or whatever and then show you related products. And you think about it, how on earth would you describe a handbag, the shape of a handbag using a text query? It's very difficult. So an image is much more natural. Um, and if you upload a picture of a fruit or a vegetable, um, my wife brings home mysterious fruits all the time. Uh, but if you upload a picture of a fruit, we try to recognize the fruit and show you the nutritional information. So these are all things you start to do. And I think just as um, speech recognition allows us and, and others to enter into research explorations or into, into prototypes like the uh, hardware prototypes like the like music player, um, the foundation of um, computer vision technology lets us enter into research explorations of surrounding hardware. So one of, uh, one of the, this is not a product, this is a research exploration. One of the sets of ideas I'm excited about is uh, Baidu Eye, which is an exploration we have for a wearable camera. So let me show you a video. There's a concept of this. Uh, actually, I think uh, Glenn, could you please play the video? So, um, ah, okay. Um, 
So we think that uh, if you're wearing the camera around and see something you don't recognize, you can try to tell you what it is. In a museum, you can say, tell me about this picture and have this wearable camera recognize the picture, use computer vision to then whisper or to speak into your left ear. The lady is wearing a microphone in her left ear patch. Um, for shopping applications, she's asking for directions and you can give her verbal uh, directions and then you can say, you know, tell me about this handbag and that handbag technology can um, speak to her to give her related information. So I think these are some of the uh, things that um, uh, possible visions for what computer vision might allow us to do. But this is not a product, this is a research exploration. Um, one question I've sometimes been asked is, you know, how does Baidu Eye compare to the smart glasses design? Uh, most most uh, popularly, most commonly, Google Glass, but also many others. And I think um, one difference is the hardware. I don't, we, I don't believe in putting something in front of your eyes, since I think that interferes with your social interactions. But more broadly, um, when you look at Baidu Eye, I think the hardware is nice. We have good hardware designers. I'm quite proud of the hardware. But even more important than the hardware is actually the software. So Baidu Eye looks like a hardware project. What it really is is a focused research project in deep learning and in AI because the secret sauce, the thing that really makes it work isn't, I mean, we can design hardware, other people can design hardware. The thing that really makes it work is the deep learning computer vision algorithms that enables it to recognize what's in front of you so they can give you additional context information. So this is a software project, at least as much as it is a hardware project. Um, and yeah, I've actually worn this for, you know, uh, what, seven, some, some period of time. It turns out that when you're wearing this, after a few minutes, you pretty much forget that you're wearing it uh, until you see something that you want to recognize and you say, you know, tell me about this handbag or whatever, and it speaks to you. Um, one of the fun features of Baidu Eye is that it also has a built-in laser pointer, so, so you can you know, see where the camera thinks it's looking. So when you're out and about, one of the commands you can give it is you can say to this thing, uh, turn laser on, and then it shoots out the laser beam. Oh, that looks cool. <laughs> so just to, just to finish up, um, a lot of internet communications has been about text, and I think that there is there is already and there will be increasingly a shift, not all the way, but a partial shift of internet communications to speech and images. Um, at Baidu, we think that within five years, 50% of web search queries will be through speech and images, not just text. Today, deep learning appears to be the best technology for helping computers understand these, um, th these types of data. And I think that uh, to the extent that the internet is about speech, images, and text, I think that whoever wins AI will win the internet. Um, and deep learning today seems like a promising technology, and um, I'm excited, both in the mobile world and in the offline world, to keep on developing these technologies to try to uh, work, perhaps with some of you, on this next transformation of the internet. Um, thank you all very much.